Hello, everybody. My name is Jorge Gerisati. I'm director of alumni at Students for Liberty. I'm also an editor at Freedom Today. And today, we will be talking about the most important topic of this year so far, which is the situation in Ukraine, which is a horrible, horrible situation. And we have two people here who will give us their testimonies. We have Felicia, who is Ukrainian, and we have Andreas, who was in Ukraine until two days ago. Uh, this is being recorded in the middle of April. So let's begin with you. I would like you to please talk to the audience, explain the situation, and please talk to us about your own experience. Hello, everyone. My name is Felicia, and I am Ukrainian. Ukrainian in my heart and my soul, and I was raised and born in Ukraine. Um, unfortunately, my country has been invaded for the last two months, and it's still hard to accept in our 21st modern century that it is possible at all. Um, there are so many stories that have happened to my friends and family members and people I know in person, and every single one is heartbreaking. Uh, the reality has changed and it's just no longer the same. All I wish and all I hope that entire world can stand with Ukraine and can show support and solidarity and this horrible nightmare can be over sometime soon, very soon. Can you talk to us about your experience as well? Um, yeah, so it's a little bit more difficult. Normally, when you're not from Ukraine and the war starts, you shouldn't go there, or I mean, from that perspective. Uh, but yeah, um, as CEO of Freedom Today, for sure, we have interest in to report to the world what's going on there. So we went everywhere where all the massacres happened. Uh, we saw the mass graves in Bucha, Irpin, Borodyanka. Uh, and we also tried to help and provide as much medical aid and try to help people to organize stuff which they needed. Uh, that's how we came into that. And if you, if you just started it once, you will not stop. Because, I mean, the Russians are not stopping, like, destroying or try to kill nearly every Ukrainian. So No, and I think something that people need to understand is that the war did not begin last month. This war, this war has been going on since 2014. Because you have one man, Vladimir Putin, who is doing everything he can to basically destroy another nation. And as Felicia said, we're in the 21st century. These things should not be happening. And the worst part is that so many people in the West are excusing unexcusable behavior, are excusing something that should be intolerable, uh, which is a war that is going to kill maybe millions of people, but hopefully not, because I think the Ukrainian people are showing us the courage that all of us should have. I think what the Ukrainian people are doing is similar to what our parents lived when the fall of the Berlin Wall, in the sense that I think it will mark the next generation, their courage, their willing to fight for freedom and sovereignty, and their right to exist as a nation, a nation that they are the ones who have the right to decide their future. Um, so with that being said, um, what wars would you have for people in the West that either do not understand the situation or either are excusing things uh, that are going on in Ukraine. What would be your, your message to them? Well, I understand it's fear about the possible World War III if everyone gets involved and if West will step in. But it doesn't justify that Ukrainian innocent people who are bravely defending right now democracy in the world should be the one struggling from all that. Um, I, I surely can recognize, yes, in these difficult times, a lot of Ukrainians are trying to leave the country, and they're becoming refugees, and they've been um, comforted by Europeans and people around the world. But there are also people like you who come to Ukraine, and there are a lot of people from around the world who want to come to Ukraine and to, to fight for Ukraine, to help those who I need. They're becoming volunteers, they're becoming uh, humanitarian help and doing as much as they can to support us. And it, I think it's really incredible. It's not like, in a situation like this, you can see both negatives and positives. There are a lot of good things that we've see, we see in our days, the humanity that's been shown and represented in so many ways. And it's really incredible and it's really touching when, when you know that there are support. But yes, I would love to encourage as well politicians, people who are in charge, people who have power to change, to, to do more things, to, to influence, to, 
I, I, I wouldn't like to say to give more weapons, but to do anything we can to close the sky for NATO, to get more involved, to impose more sanctions, to anything we can to stop war in Ukraine. Uh, can you comment uh, about your work, for example, with your friends, Mikhailo, Daniil, and all the guys are Ukrainian students for freedom? Yeah, for sure. I, I can t I can totally say just positive things. I mean, it's like we, we try to organize things which are needed from A to B. So we, exactly. I mean, for example, a hospital in, um, for example, let's say Lviv, they need this and this. Then we get a list. We try to organize it from a hospital in Germany or in Poland or in Denmark. So and then we ship it to Warsaw. From Warsaw, it goes to Lviv or somewhere or even to through Slovakia or Romania. We have so many people all over and then it goes directly where it's needed. Exactly. Now, and not like, I mean, governments are doing also some good things. I, I wouldn't say no, we don't, <laughs> they shouldn't be involved, but yeah. we need them. We, we need them in that case. We need to do more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, but in, in, in reality, the NGOs are doing the most of the stuff. They, yeah. br they bring the, the goods, they, they deliver the stuff to the people. And I mean, the people who are on the ground knows best where it's needed. Exactly. Who, who else should it be? Yeah, I mean, if I say, yeah, the German government can send whatever, like uh, 10 trains there, yeah, that's nice if, if the stuff is not reaching the people. That doesn't exactly. make any and sense at all. And how do you feel the spirit? Yeah, the spirit, people there. Well, the spirit is super cool. That's right. why I'm doing that. I mean, these people, we need to defend them. I mean, exactly. they are like the bravest people in the whole world I've ever seen. They're optimistic about the future. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's, I mean or sometimes I see, I think it's a little bit unrealistic. But I mean, you have to say that they will win the war and there's no other yeah. choice. Because let's be a little bit more honest, it's not just a war. Russia wants to commit a genocide on Ukrainian people. Yep. And we just have to listen what the officials are saying. Yep. Putin mentioned a few times the, the uh, Ukraine has no right to exist. Yeah? That means, per definition, that no Ukrainian has a right to exist. So, I mean, he's just, I mean, just follow his words. Yeah. I mean, I think he's not bluffing or faking. Mm -hmm. like, I mean, we could, we could, we could uh, come no, to, the, to the next topic, to all this fake bullshit they, they bring up. And that's why we have been writing about it since, what, like October? Yeah, at least. Because so many people telling us, no, this is a bluff. He's doing nothing. He wants to negotiate. And we were saying, no, this guy has an agenda. He has an ideology. Because so many people in the West, I think, paint him as a, as a realist, as a tactician. Nothing can be further from the truth. This guy is highly ideological. He has this twisted mentality, this twi twisted vision of Ukrainians. And, and as you said, he's not bluffing. Uh, he's following the same pattern that the Nazis follow. And it's extremely dangerous. And if we don't stop him now, when will we? If we had stopped him in 2014, this would not have been happening. If we had stopped him in 2008, this would not have been happening. And Coming back to your experience, for instance, you were in Ukraine in 2014, right? Can yeah. you talk to us about it? And I mean, I mean, f just just for example, I mean, there's always this story as they are brothers, the Ukrainians and the Russians. I mean, that's a bullshit story. Yeah. I mean, they are, they are totally different. But for example, many people say, then yeah, the Ukrainians they hated the Russians. This is just bullshit. Yeah. Every time when we've been there, we had a translator, and he was just speaking Russian. And we never had a problem. I think, I don't, I think half of the people speaking Russian, they had never a problem with that. No. And, and now uh, also some, some stories what people need to realize. I mean, the hardest fighters at the front line, or, or many of them, everybody is talking about this mysterious ass of blah, blah, blah. We come to that maybe a little bit, a uh, few <coughs> minutes later. But the hardest fighters are the Russian speaking Ukrainians. That's even stupid to call them like that because right. they are just Russian people who are living there are Ukrainians, yeah. but they are the toughest fighters. And then everybody's asking me, why is it like that? And then somebody explained to me, look, somebody's coming to your village, destroys the house of you and your friend. Yeah. Wait, you don't give a damn shit if what is this religion, what he speaks, At all. Yes. you will hate the same person, 100,000%. Yeah. Yeah, That's exactly. so super easy to, to understand. But I mean, well, what's your experience like? Um, for as in, from an Ukrainian point of view, about all this conspiracy bullshit, what they're bringing up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what can you say about that? Well, I will say that I'm originally from Zaporozhye. That's the city where everyone speaks Russian. I've been speaking in Russian language all my life, and it's never been a problem. We don't judge each other. We accept equally everyone, regardless if you speak Ukrainian or you speak Russian. And I know there are men in the front line Russian-speaking men from Kharkov, from Dnipropetrovsk, from Zaporozhye, who are Russian-speaking ones, and they defend the liberty, they defend the freedom of my independent country. So, um, 
Do you know, like, like, I mean, what would you answer these people with all this conspiracy? Let's let's address some like bioweapons in Ukraine. What about? Do you have a uh, lot of yeah. bioweapon laboratories, or what was that? Um, as one of my friends made a post on Instagram, RIP to democracy of press in Russia, because it just simply doesn't exist. There are monopoly who are making up the stories and ma making up the stories that we are having some laboratories and sending out birds on the Russian territory to poison uh, to poison them or uh, to. Um, uh, did, did you know that you, cre you created the coronavirus, by the way? Do you know <laughs> that? No, the Russian state media is saying that Ukrainians uh, created the coronavirus. <laughs> yes. So, unfortunately. Yeah, the Russian state media does not broadcast, doesn't show the reality, and people been f blinded and been zombied for so many years. So this is definitely unrelevant to what has been spoken in the Russian media. But what about, do you have like personal connections to people in Russia, like even relatives or something like that? Uh, I don't have any relatives in Russia. I used to work on cruise ships, so I do have few friends and few people I know from Russian Federation. In fact, there are a few of them who reached out to me and wanted to launch apologies and they apologized to what's happening in Ukraine because of their government, because of what, because of the Russian dictator uh, Vladimir Putin. And um, I see there are still people who wants Ukraine to be a free country and who are on our side and just afraid to speak up because of the possible 15 years being spent in jail. But yeah, there are also people who truly believe in propaganda and think it's right. And I know a friend, I know friends whose parents said, no, I'm sorry, my child, you are Ukraine, you are, uh, you are young Bander uh, boy, so <laughs> I don't want to believe you. At this point, we're gonna go separate directions. And there's a father and a son. So unfortunately, I don't think it's possible to change something in Russian mindset at this stage. Maybe you could also mention, I mean, you are from Venezuela, so, you have also an impact of Russia in your yeah. country. <laughs> it is, it is. Something that was astonishing to me is that I had five years without coming back to Venezuela. And in 2020, I came back, partially because I wanted to understand the reality of my people. Because it's not the same to read what people say in, on Twitter than to actually talk to the people that they don't have social media, they don't have even electricity, most part of their days. So I remember that one of the things that really struck me, and I wrote about it uh, at the time, is that because of the lack of, of media outlets in Venezuela, because of the lack of information in general, I start seeing the same conspiracy theories that I see from the Russian propaganda in the mainstream of Venezuelan like public discourse. The, the same things, you know? And to me, it showed the, the capabilities of the Russian government in terms of propaganda. And you are also seeing this like in the far right groups in the US, which to me is astonishing, you know? And then you have like the, the far left and the far, far right uh, political parties simply buying this propaganda. And what do you think they're buying? Do they really believe it? Do you think there is money involved? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Because to me, like, it's, uh, it's astonishing that someone could I, really believe I, I, that. I mean, I mean, with the media outlets, I, I mean, I would say 90% or 95% of all alternative medias are pro-Russia. And they always were. And they were feed the whole time over the last years with bullshit story, whatever right. it is. I mean, there's a Hunter Biden stuff, OK, yeah. For, for sure, he's corrupt, and his father is corrupt. I mean, they're politicians. Sure, I exactly. Mean, let's, let's be yeah. realistic. Yeah, but that then to yeah, jump yeah, to. Yeah, exactly. And then, like, for example, the, the bioweapon uh, laboratory story is uh, interesting, because people should look up. They b made the same story with Georgia a few years ago. So okay. there were bioweapon laboratories in Georgia, and everybody knew how it ended up. Yeah. Um, I think they were feed over the last years with this bullshit just for a moment like this. No, uh, of course, exactly. Just, just, you know, they have been uh, years. Uh, exactly. That. I mean, yeah. whatever it is, if it's Illuminati or Freemason bullshit, whatever you can imagine. I mean, just uh, this is like to, to feed them the whole time, to give them animation for this bullshit story for a moment like this. When Russia needs them and now they show up and defend them. Yeah. Blindly, totally blindly. I talked to friends, they're really smart and clever. I mean, I was like, when is the point when you see, when you stop defending that? When, when he's throwing a nuclear bomb? Yeah. I mean, if he, what, what then? Yeah, when, when is the red line? Yeah. Exactly, yes. What needs to happen? Yeah, exactly, in the red line, I think it's, it's long over. It's, 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 the red line is crossed. It's, it's, it's crossed long, out since it's a long time now. Yes, it's more than 10 years ago, actually. Yeah, exactly. If we had to stop him yeah. when we could, 
this could not yeah, have happened. I mean, I can understand maybe the people or some people from the West will say, okay, yeah, I, I wouldn't advocate, for example, for going into NATO, for example, but at least give the Ukrainians every weapon they need that they can defend themselves. That's, exactly. that's like a human right that you can defend your, your own life. Yeah, if, if you don't have the balls to step in by yourself, at least give it to them. Exactly. <laughs> and in the end, in the, and I think you will, you will make it happen. You will make the job done. Which is unbelievable, yeah. what, the Ukrainian, the, what the Ukrainian people have done, like in terms of defending themselves and winning this war. Because this is a they war already that won, like, more than everybody ever yeah, thought. <laughs> Putin thought that in two days they would take Kiev. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it shows also the way he saw Ukrainians. Yeah. He thought that they would not give a fight. He thought that it could be like Afghanistan. Yeah, you know? yeah, no, he, I mean, I mean he, he thought he will be. I mean, people will be on the on the streets and uh, raising yeah, fl wearing, fl wearing flowers and stuff like that. The only thing there was this really famous video from this grandma. The grand, an Ukrainian grandma talked to a Russian soldier, and he was like, "Okay, why do, don't you want to have us here?" And the grandma was just saying, "The only flower you can expect is the flower on your grave." <laughs> yeah, the, the sunflower. <laughs> Oh, the seeds. Yeah, yeah, the seeds of the sunflower. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I give you seeds. I think she wanted to give him seeds or something like that. And he was like, for what? Yeah, it's for your grave. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but this is like, we, I mean, just let's talk about a little bit about Russia and the people in Russia. Um, yeah, that's important. Yeah, you know, for, for, from my point of view, first of all, for sure, not everybody is brainwashed. Yeah? I mean, most of them left. Who, who, who's clever? Left. Yes. Left and... Um, what do I want to say? <laughs> Just go on, I totally yeah. forgot it. No, no, basically you want to talk about people in Russia. What mm -hmm. are they thinking? No, no, I mean, like I mean, look, look, the Ukrainians stand in front of tanks. Right. Yeah, you, everybody knows this famous tank man video from yeah. China, but there were hundreds of Ukrainians yeah. di di who did it. Yeah, like in Venezuela, we did e the same. Exactly. Yeah. And then, then like, okay, at the same time, okay, people in Ukraine or in Venezuela can stand in front of tanks, yeah. but in Russia, you couldn't even fight the police. Like, so come on, let's yes. get things in a, so you know, Exactly. exactly. I mean, for sure it's bad to go in Russia on the streets. But also, I know, for example, Sana Nemtsova since a long time and all these people from the opposition, but they are all, all out of Russia since a, since a long time. And there yep. is no real opposition. That's also yep. a problem. There is no real opposition. They are rather dead or in prison. Or poisoned. Yeah, yeah or poisoned yeah. or in prison yeah, or, or in whatever. Exile. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Or in exile or somewhere. Yeah. I mean, there's Khodorkovsky who is doing a good job. There's Kasparov. Yeah, they, for sure there are some. But where is their influence in Russia? Right. Now I don't see it. No, no, it's impossible because there is no avenue for yeah. them to actually get in power. Uh, exactly. What other things do you think we need to we need to mention, uh, or the international community should know? Because something that something that and coming back to the topic of communication, we have the Russians with this propaganda, but the images taken by by the Ukrainians were so powerful, and the way they communicate and the way Zelensky communicates, that I think opened the eyes of many people. And I'm glad because of that, because one week before the invasion, the public discourse was really bad, mm -hmm. really bad. And it still is, but it's much better than I thought. So what other things do you think people should know about the situation um, overall? I'm getting really angry when people calling war conflict. It is not just a conflict. It's a full-scale war. It's an invasion. It's an invasion of my country. It's not Ukrainians who all of a sudden decided to wake up in the morning and visit Russia with weapons, uh, it's, it happened differently. I'm really proud of our uh, President Zelensky who keeps the spirit and inspires a lot of people around the world to, to stand up for his country. He had a chance to escape, he was offered to leave, but he decided to stay in the front line and remain with his people, with his country. I think that the most important thing, if we can get something good out of this horrible situation, is that we need to finally wake up. Like, we need to wake up. The 1990s, that idealism, that naive idealism, that the world was going towards democracy and we had to do nothing about it, that's gone. That's done. We need to go towards a new territory in which we need to fight for freedom every day, every time we wake up. Because those who want to take away our freedom, they're working for their cause every day. The Iranians, the Venezuelans, the Russians, the Chinese, they're doing that and they're working together. And I saw that, for example, when I was in Venezuela. I saw how the Iranian government and the Venezuelan government are cooperating on so many stuff, on how to circumvent sanctions, on how to increase the, the monitoring of the people. And we, who believe in freedom, we need to be as together as we can. And we need to really work together to create our own institutions, our own cooperation. We need to join and we need to 
bring together people from Belarus, from Venezuela, from Nicaragua. So we can also have these spaces of communication. For example, today we are in Prague at LibreCon uh, because we are bringing together activists for, from so many different countries. I think we have over 700 people today. And just talking to them, then they not only inspire me, but we also get to know each other, we also get to exchange inf information, and we can get better together. I support the, the cause for a free Ukraine because I feel it as the cause of a free Venezuela. Uh, because we have the same vision, despite the differences or where we come from, or differences in religion, or differences in language, we want the same, which is to be free. Which is something that the Russians, they will never understand. That what we are fighting is not because someone is telling us something. It's because we want to be free, nothing else. And if they don't have the courage, well, the Ukrainians, they have the courage. And those are the people that I admire, and those are the people that will take a bullet from them. I mean, what, what, what shall I add to that? That was, that, that was nearly perfect. I, I can just say... No, no, because again, like, uh, I see so many people uh, just not getting the importance of this. They are fighting for the, for the freedom of all of us. Yeah. Because when is the red line? <laughs> then Iran will do something. And then Russia, let's say that they put, some, they put a military base on Venezuela or, or something like that. When is the red line? When, will, when we will say, okay, stop here. And you yeah, just make it even bigger. I mean, if, if for example, if Russia will, will win the war in, in Ukraine, when will they stop? In Moldova? In the Baltics? Who's next? Like in Poland? Who's, who's next? And, and it's like I mentioned that when we talked before, that's like you are in a bar and there's a guy punching 10 people. Yeah, This guy needs to be stopped from yes. somebody. So let, let's be just realistic. I mean, this is, it can happen every evening in every town. When, when, you, have, when you have a kid in a school, and someone is bothering him, mm -hmm. the first thing you tell him, hey, stop him. <laughs> right yeah. now, do not wait, because then he will do more and yeah, more and more exactly. to you. Yeah, when, you have sure. a, when you have a bully, yeah. you need to fight back right away. And I think those people who believe in appeasement, they don't know history, they don't know human nature, and I think they have never been like in a real, you know, human human situation. Yeah, yeah. You know? and uh, for, for sh also they don't know uh, what what the distances is. But I mean, Ukraine that sounds like so far away. But come on, this is like Lviv, uh, Berlin yeah. is like 800 kilometers or something like that. That's true. That's like come on, that's in front of your door. And yes. then, then all these stupid liber some I wouldn't even call them libertarians from the Mises Institute and all these Ron Paul, yeah, Ron Paul the idiots. Yeah. yeah. So uh, they were like, yeah, but we have nothing to do. That's not in my garden. And say, like, okay, look. But Jesus. you see your neighbor is being raped and somebody's burning the house and you say, oh, I have nothing to do with that? No. Okay, wait, bro. He will come to you. He will come to you. So that's, that's the reality. <laughs> Sorry about it. Um, so this means that we have just a few minutes left. Yeah. Uh, so do you want to give a close statement uh, to our viewers? Uh, we are proud of you, you know, of everything that you have done. Uh, we love that you are in Students for Liberty with us. Uh, so yeah, those, any final comment? I'm happy to be with Students for Liberty and part of this conference where activists like us support freedom in the world, support a um, happier future for our next generations, for young students, for rising kids. And that's exactly what we need to fight now. If it, if it doesn't happen now, it will reflect on the next generations and we don't want this to happen. Um, I want to say that the war has taught me that there is no reason to complain when you have a safe sky above your head, when you live in a peaceful place, when you are safe and when your house is not invaded. This is a huge lesson to learn for us and I wish for people like us who are standing right now in the conference, but those who are in Ukraine right now, which have exactly the same equal opportunity to enjoy, build their happy, free future in their homes, in their countries, in their country, and be protected and not experience any harm like they do it now. Any final comment? Oh, not yet. I'm uh, done. Uh, we, I think we're we running have. out of time. That's why I make <laughs> yeah. it as, as quick as possible. Exactly. Uh, and I think the closing yeah. statement of her was perfect. It was. We, we should leave it like this. Yes. Uh, thank you very much on behalf of the Students for Liberty and on Freedom Today. Uh, thank you for watching.